Hi everyone, it's Roger Kalia, Music Director of Symphony New Hampshire, and I would like to invite you to our upcoming live stream concert titled Bienvenue Printemps. This concert will be taking place on Friday, March 5th at 7.30 p.m. You can find all of the live stream details on our website, www.symphonynh.org. The Afternoon of a Fawn is a poem by Stefan Mallarmé that takes the ancient myth of the god Pan pursuing the nymph Syrinx and develops from it an elusive dream world exploring the borderline between the conscious and the unconscious, reality and dream. A fawn, half human, half goat, intoxicated by visions of an entwined pair of nymphs, tries to seize them, and as they flee, abandons himself to dreaming. Debussy's original plan was for several pieces of music to be interwoven with a reading of the poem. But in the end, Debussy decided to write a single piece. Debussy and Mallarmé were already friends at the time when the composer began work on his prelude in 1892. Mallarmé first heard this music in Debussy's apartment, where the composer played his score at the piano. Mallarmé said, I didn't expect anything like this. This music prolongs the emotion of my poem and sets its scene more vividly than color. He later said that Debussy's music presents no dissonance with my text. Rather, it goes further into the nostalgia and light with subtlety, malaise, and richness. Now, imagine the audience's reaction one evening in 1894 when it was given its first hearing. All this either captivated or repelled those listeners who couldn't understand anything that veered too far from traditional convention. Those with more open minds saw the glimmer of a new dawn, the shimmering orchestral color changes, strings tremoloing over the fingerboard, wind instruments melting one into another, and the beautiful and inventive harp writing. This was the beginning of Impressionism in music as we know it. Debussy's prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn was his earliest international triumph, and it remains his most popular orchestral work. More than that, in its fluid treatment of its themes, which constantly evolve without ever quite repeating themselves, and in its floating harmonies, it created a precedent on which many composers were to draw into the 20th century just as Wagner's Tristan had opened the floodgates of feverish chromaticism 30 years earlier. The prelude begins with perhaps the most famous orchestral flute solo in the repertoire. The unaccompanied flute solo plunges us into harmonic uncertainty. The opening rise and fall extends from C sharp down to G natural. The interval of a tritone making the melody hang in the air without any sense of a key. The whole of the prelude can be considered a series of variations on a single theme, and we can simply listen to the ways it changes almost imperceptibly and grows. Toward the end of his life, the great composer Maurice Ravel remembered that it was upon hearing this work so many years ago that I first understood what real music was. The conductor-composer Pierre Boulez would later date the awakening of modern music from Debussy's score. Leonard Bernstein discussed the piece at length in his 1970s Harvard lectures, finding not just stylistic, but radical change. Mallarmé's dream come true. Even in the Fawn's first notes, he found that malaise the poet identified. We will be performing for you an arrangement for a reduced orchestra by Ian Farrington. French composer Charles Gounod is known as one of the 19th century's most prolific composers of both sacred and secular music. Though often overshadowed by the music of his contemporaries such as Sassons, Bizet, and Debussy, Gounod's music is often viewed as an essential part of the French nationalistic and anti-Wagnerian musical repertoire. He wrote hundreds of sacred and secular pieces in various genres throughout his lifetime. Described by Edward Blakeman as a benchmark for French wind ensemble music, Gounod's Petite Symphony 
was written as a tribute to his friend Paul Taffanel, a noted flute virtuoso and founder of the French flute school at the Paris Conservatoire. Taffanel established the Wind Chamber Music Society in 1879, and the Petite Symphony was premiered at a concert for the Society on April 30th, 1885. The work is in four movements, fast, slow, scherzo, and fast, and it is scored for a wind ensemble of nine players, one flute, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, and two horns. We will be performing the fourth movement finale titled Allegretto. The piece straddles the boundary of large ensemble chamber music and wind symphony. The finale is fun and boisterous and it sparkles with lightness and energy. It is quite similar to the finales of Haydn style classical symphonies in terms of its form as well as the call and response nature of the different themes. It's very conversational. The solo oboe is featured prominently throughout the movement. Jacques Guibert represents the quintessential Parisian composer of the early to mid 20th century. Cultivated but not pompous, technically adept but self-effacing, blending the serious with the popular, typically good-spirited and often witty. He was drawn to both music and theater, but his first professional steps after high school were hardly distinguished. He started working as a movie hall pianist and writing popular songs under the pseudonym William Bertie. He eventually enrolled at the Paris Conservatoire in 1910, initially as a drama student. Hibert, one of Les Six, a French composers looking for new musical expression, was for a time at the forefront of neoclassicism. In 1930, he turned to the classical promise of the wind quintet, and from that was born one of his most cherished chamber works, three short pieces. Hibert's charming quintet shows him at his most colorful and inventive best. Hibert fashioned it so that its movements could be played in any order or independently without any compromise to the work as a whole. He found the woodwind quintet to be an opportunity to show boundless colors in simple combinations. He also delighted in writing works as sheer entertainment, which three short pieces provides brilliantly. The rather puffed up and lovely introductory fanfare of the first movement becomes gently sarcastic when it devolves into a bird call passage. More wittiness follows when the sprightly march-like theme evolves into a waltz. The march and waltz then battle for supremacy and Hibert chooses the dance. The second movement is a surprise in color and beauty from only two instruments, the flute and clarinet ending by adding a few more instruments to prepare for the jocular third movement. In the finale, Hibert again flexes his talent for sonority. All five instruments here combine for some wonderful colors and a whirlwind of women fun. A slightly drunken jig-like theme is punctuated with vocalistic runs and hints of good old fashioned 1930s dance hall music. It has been said that Maurice Ravel saw the world through the eyes of a child. Although he had no children of his own, Ravel had a lifelong fascination with elaborate mechanical toys and frequently read fairy tales aloud to the children of his friends. Two of these children were Jean and Mimi Godepski, the son and daughter of Kipa and Ida Godepski, a Polish couple who frequently brought together some of the greatest artists of the time at gatherings in their Paris apartment. In addition to Ravel, guests at their soirees included Eric Satie, Igor Stravinsky, and Jean Cocteau, among others. In 1908, when Jean and Mimi were eight and 10 years old respectively, Ravel composed the Mother Goose Suite, a four-hand piano composition for them to play together. Each movement from the suite depicts a character from the Mother Goose fairy tales, Ravel offered this description. My intention of awaking the poetry of childhood in these pieces naturally led me to simplify my style and thin out my writing. In 1911, Ravel transformed the original piano suite into a vibrantly colorful orchestral ballet score. We will be performing the final two movements of the suite for chamber orchestra in an arrangement by Ian Farrington. 
The opening of Beauty and the Beast is in slow waltz time, reminiscent of Satie's Gymnepides. A shy and unassuming melody is played by the clarinet, which evokes beauty, accompanied by harp and muted strings with pizzicato bass. The Beast quietly enters, represented by a low contrabassoon in the original piece playing a creeping figure. Beauty's theme is combined with the contrabassoon of the Beast, but with anxious harmonies. The music builds to a climax, and then, as she is reassured, her theme returns to more comfortable harmonies, still accompanied by the contrabassoon. This time, the music builds to a passionate climax and a cymbal crash. There is a harp glissando followed by high harmonics on the solo violin, and as the beast is transformed into the prince, the movement ends with delicate final chords. The final movement of the suite is simply called the fairy garden. The opening is almost like a hymn for strings only. This is the first time in the entire suite that the strings have played a theme on their own without woodwinds, harp, or other instruments. The hymn builds up, and from its beautiful climax, with rather foray-like modal harmonies, emerges a solo violin accompanied in unison by the celeste. Eventually, the mood of the opening hymn returns. The music builds to a final climax for full orchestra with glissandi in the harp and celeste and the ringing of bells on the glockenspiel.